Okay, I have a Sansui CD player, a CD-X301i. It supposedly doesn't work. It's got a disc in it. Unfortunately, the place that sold it, because it's not working, they've removed the power cord. Cut that off, so I'm gonna have to, that's the first job, it's gonna be to get, get this cable clamp out. Or cable clamp grommet. Not sure if I need some pliers. Well, now I'll get it out easy. I might even have to take the back off. Of course, my pliers are gone. Never in the same place for five minutes. Usually, you can get these out by squeezing them. Yeah, that's all it needs. Squeeze it with a pair of electrical pliers. Move that. I'm just going to temporarily hook this up for now. Now, even though these are audio gear and most of it's low voltage, you know, so you've got a we've got a voltage selector switch on the back here with lots of bare terminals, which goes off to the transformer here. Again, bare terminals. Uh, we've got the power cord comes in on bare terminals and the power switch, power switch itself. So you've got to be quite careful with this stuff. Like this, you think audio is going to be relatively safe, but it's actually some of the most dangerous stuff to work on. At least microwave ovens or television sets you know you're working on sort of dangerous voltages this stuff you tend to get a little bit more complacent with it and think that you're just on low voltage but it's easy when you're messing around with these things to have a finger come out and touch one of these things i've had a couple of shocks off like cassette players and stuff over the years so all i'm going to use here is just a, a power cord cut off something and it's just got a terminal block on the end these are perfect for anything just to Temporary hook up a power cord to it while you're testing it And just see, get the thing going See if it's worth fixing This looks like a quite a nice Japanese made CD player, but The problem with these is they often have oddball lasers in them and they don't always last the best or if it's had high hours The laser can be worn out when I mean, obviously this lead another thing to be a little bit careful of Put that clamp grommet away Plug that in. Hmm, sounds like it might just be a mechanical problem. Ah, well, I could have seen that already. That belt there is, oh, goo. Very, oh, yep, yeah, she's turned it, oh, look at that. Lovely. It's turned to oil, shouldn't have wiped that on me buddy car, but I guess we're in there. <laughs> now I've got it all over my hand. Bit of meth, I should hopefully get that off. So that's turned to complete goo. Which is a good sign, that probably means this CD player has just been put away for who knows how long and... Oh yeah, if I turn that, there goes the old belt all over the place, but we can probably actually... There you go, just simply... Hey, the belt's come off now, I'll just... I was going to measure that, but I, don't, I think we'll just turf that in the rubbish to get it out of the way. Is that all the belt? Oops. So now I can, just by winding this by hand... Maybe I'll just pull the tray. Piano Adventures, lesson book, primal level, whatever. So, it might just be a simple belt problem. Turn the power right off because I'll just turn off the power switch. Always remember, best to have a power point on the front of your bench where you can see it and you can always just look to the side and make sure you've got the power off for sure. It looks like yeah, we just got to, that'll be the main loading motor and the pulley there. Little pulley on that, and that runs all these gears which drive the tray. Ooh, that didn't sound too good. Ooh, that is squeaky. I think that's coming from one of these gears, so it might need more than just a a lubrication uh, new belt. It needed a lubrication as well. I'm just wondering how that's actually held together. There's probably something underneath. Maybe not, there's a weird plastic pin there. That's got a little clip on top of it. That one would pull up once you pull the other one up. I'm just wondering how that one comes out. I'd prefer not to pull the mech apart if I can help it. Yeah, I don't know what sort of laser that's got in there. Not one I recognise, so it's probably one of the many oddball lasers. A lot of these later CD players all went for the, like, the Sony KSS series lasers and mechanisms. This one's 
either a bit earlier or still um, Sansui and making their own thing which you'd hope for a higher end brand that would be a little bit better than some of what the generic Sony ones which were used in in the sort of basic Sony equipment and lots of shelf systems and even portable systems and stuff so they were kind of used from high end to low end stuff did the job alright besides the spin motors failing in them quite a lot I might just give that a clean Let's see if I've actually, I've just ordered some new belts to replace some of these shorter ones that I was missing. I probably still won't have the right length in stock. No, my luck, but hopefully we'll have something that will at least allow us to test this thing. Of course, what I can do is just, I could, I guess I could demonstrate it, just we can wind this thing in by hand. Not sure why it wasn't operating when it was, the disc was loaded, I think, but but make sure you clean these pulleys in the little slot where the belt goes and just remove any old bits of belt when I throw that disc oh it's actually that that's scraping I think oh yeah it is it's something on here see those marks in the dust it's a bit of an odd design I wonder why that would Ugh. Well that should, uh, hang on, that's probably my fault. Ah, that's what it is. That's all my fault, I should have left that gear. I must have pulled it out before it had fully lifted up, so that was just the tray was sitting, to, the clamp was sitting too low. Now that should catch on something, I would think. See, this is where it gets a bit messier. Yeah, that probably goes in that last bit, then we wind it down. So that should, theoretically, ah, oh, you know, that should run, I think. Here we go. So it must have been just slightly out. I've got the play button up. I'm not seeing any. Oh, yeah, track one. Anyway, starting to get the time coming up. So it's going to say that should run once it's in the loaded position. So you can manually load these things in. And once that clamps down, the laser should kick in. If I hit open close, it's not much point because there's a few things I guess if I can get this clamp off easily, which I'm not sure I can. So that goes up into that position. Does this oh it must be a second okay, so yeah, so we've got a second gear. Looks like this top bit stops turning. And if the motor kept going we then get the tray out, so that's that explains the squeaky problem, and then we've got a stop switch. I mean it won't hurt to give this thing a clean. How on earth have they got this locked in place? Does that just slide sideways or something? There's a bit of a spring under this, These, they all often shoot off. Now definitely make sure you've got the power out because again all this backboard is live or potentially live. What holds that together? There's, I can see something white in there, no that's not it. Oh yeah maybe it is it. Maybe I've got to drop that down so this is half the fun when you work on a model you're not familiar with. I'm guessing there might be something under the mechanism. But I won't have to give this thing a bit of a service while I'm at it. So it looks like it really just needs a belt most likely. Could need some other adjustments but it's always good to give the laser a clean. And sometimes the laser needs a little bit of adjustment. Which I don't have any of the old, I used to have some test discs that I knew where they'd skip and all that sort of thing. Sometimes just some old, you could buy proper alignment discs, but most of the time they weren't an awful lot of use. So now I'm just, you've got to lever these a little bit at the bottom, just as there's a couple of little mounting tabs. So you just bend the bottom of the door out ever so slightly and carefully, and then slide upwards, which will get those tabs to just pull out where they catch on the front. So you usually got to remove that door part. And now this is this odd, where do I have it about there somewhere, yeah that's it, get the mechanism back in and hopefully there's got some rubber mounts there that seem to be hanging on, yep, probably should have took the front panel off on this one, it's a little tight, yeah we've got this little piece here I think, is something to do with allowing the clamp to come out, 
I have never worked on one of these before. So we've got another motor, that's the sled motor. It's basically got three motors in most CD players. That's a loading motor for the tray. You've got the sled motor as it's called, the sled being what the laser here, this is the bottom end of the laser. That slides back and forwards, it's got a plastic thing on one thing and, and some have two of these little metal slidey bits, some just have a plastic bit on one end that sort of sits in there slightly loose on one end and it goes up and down so you normally need to lubricate that or at least clean it and usually a little bit of fresh grease on it. This is, The grease on this seems nice and uh, nice and lube, luby still, what's the word for it? It's not viscous or anything, it's still very slippery. Um, so that's that and then we've got the spin motor which is what spins your disc so the clamp on the top here comes down onto that or the little plaited thing on the other side of it and then yeah once once it's in if that laser's back at all often you'll find most of them the laser will reset into the center there's another way of often testing a cd player is you can manually wind the laser this one i'll have to turn the worm wheel on the and we're going the right way probably not now see so the laser i can manually wind it back so the laser always starts at the center of the disc that's where the table of contents is and that's what it reads first to say you know how many tracks and what length the disc is and all that sort of thing so one thing if you if you're not sure what's going on with one of these is you want manually wind it back a bit and as soon as the disc loads in and clamps that sh that um, laser assembly should slide along the sled motor should start and often, often there will even if they're at the beginning sometimes because there's a little micro switch here they'll actually go back a bit and press it just to make sure they're in the center so they have to do that first then then they try to spin up the disc so basically the laser will, will come back into the center the laser will, the little lens will start going up and down the lot the laser itself will come on which you you shouldn't look into the laser directly but you can often by looking on a fair angle at the lens you can see it's a slight red glow in there like a red LED that's enough to know I don't think I've ever had a CD player where the laser didn't light I think it could be a problem in some of the really early ones, but generally they don't fail, at least in the lighting part. Um, and then, yeah, the, the lens will start going up and down, searching, doing a focus search, and if there's a disc in there, it should find the disc. Once it's found the focus, it then starts up the spin motor and starts trying to read the data off it. Data is read by this little, this, got, this one's quite obvious to see, it's a little clear IC, a little 8 pin IC type thing, and that's. I think four diodes in there, photo diodes, and they're the things that track, they try and always keep the spot sort of centered. They read the information and they also keep the the tracking and stuff happening. With a little they usually have these two sort of connectors on the laser. It's got a red and a white one, and there's a little laser power adjustment pot which you normally shouldn't touch and don't need to touch. But maybe as a last desperate act trying to get a laser that's not working too well going you might want to play with that but I still haven't worked out how this relates to the oh there it is I did I just didn't want to pull too hard so that's got a little clip thing by the look of it so I pulled that out which now if I wind ah, wrong way probably wind everything back this thing wants to come back down I have to help it by hand get this tray out of the way I'm hoping that I can now slide this sideways yep and just be careful because there's a big spring under here uh, this one's actually attached I think not that well at least it's attached to one end some of these you'll take this off and the spring will go flying so that's the top part of the clamp there that just sits on the spindle there's our actual spindle on the spin motor that does seem a little probably would be a little bit stiff now sometimes you need to put a little bit of oil just down in there spinning quite freely now this hasn't been used for so long so there's our laser lens always they've got this little black plastic thing normally with yeah, this geared part down one side which is what runs the sled back and forwards and you've got this little lens and like I say even if you're sort of looking back at 45 degrees or so when the thing powers up you should be able to see the light come on in there and then the little lens will start going up and down I'm going to clean them it's as simple as you just get a cotton bud and a bit of metho and just gently give that a a wipe you know technically these these are all mounted on coils and stuff so that they can adjust so you can see it can go side to side and they can go up and down so they're technically fragile but they're, they're reasonably strong 
they can take a little bit of movement and stuff so there's a few hairs on there which we certainly don't want any sort of dust and stuff it's best to get rid of there's a bit of odd looking stuff there I don't know what that that stuff around the spring is now oh, it's coming out of there oh there's a bit here's ah oh, there's been a bit of foam in the spring that's all I'll get rid of that that's definitely get rid of that sometimes they have a bit of foam packing inside the spring I'm not even sure what it really does but whether it's meant to dampen it or keep it quiet or something but yeah, if that starts falling a bit, it's best to just get rid of it. And yeah, that grease doesn't look too bad. Uh, I probably should, since that's a uh, white grease, I might just use a bit of the plasticky grease since one side is plastic. Where do I put that little screwdriver? And just put a little bit of fresh grease along there. On the inside, a little bit on this bit. What you really need to do is it's annoying when they got the worm wheel set up. Makes it, I think most of them do. It just makes it slow to normally wind the laser right out. That'll help smear some of the new grease around and leaves a clear bit on the other side. Where it's already slid, you can just put a bit more grease on there. It's not too critical, but it doesn't hurt to put a little bit on there while you're in here. Don't overdo it, but just a little bit where those on that metal shaft, some of them, like I say, have two, two metal bits, one each side, some have the plastic on one side. So we've cleaned it, we've lubed it. I can think I can get access to that later anyway. Often it doesn't hurt to get a cotton bun and clean the surface on these as well because they pick up a bit of muck when they're clamping the disc sometimes, a bit of dust or grease or whatever that sometimes is on discs. And the same with the other bit. I like to give them a clean because any lumps of, like that's got a little lump of something there that's come off now. Any lumps of stuff on this is just going to make the disc a little bit more eccentric or not so much eccentric, more going up and down a bit and that just adds if the laser's getting old it just makes its life that little bit harder just spring in there and push this back together oops try and get everything to go together that's in place put our little lock back in there and that went that way yeah, nice and simple yeah, this thing almost looks like new, it's so good. And that grease seems to be fine, there's plenty of it. I don't think I'll worry about greasing. You could grease the gear and the little worm wheel on the motor there. Normally the loading motors don't cause any trouble or need anything done to them. Whoops, I've left that in the squeaky position again. Sometimes you can just push these in by hand rather than having a... Ah, oh, and then we've got this. It's got to be in the right spot. Yeah, a bit of an odd mechanism this one. Now yeah, the other thing, what are these rubber things? Because these rubber mounts sometimes go hard. They don't seem too bad. That can cause skipping problems or it to be more vibration sensitive if Yeah, because this normally you'd have a little a smaller mechanism within the main mech that's on springs and rubber mounts. This thing they've actually decided to do the whole it's one big metal plate. And they put these rubber bits on. I'm just cleaning a bit of this, some sort of muck on them. Maybe it's just discoloration. It's got a kind of white layer, but they, they're still fairly rubbery. They haven't gone hard. If these go hard, they'll certainly cause problems. <laughs> just blow out all that. <laughs> there is bits of that. And oh, there's the rest of that belt too. I thought a bit of it dropped in there. Bits of foam off that. <laughs> clamp just trying to get as much of that out of the unit as possible it's not really going to matter much but yeah, I think ideally I can kind of get them in there oh no maybe I can't I think I should have took the front panel off this one you can actually undo this screw and pull some of these plugs if you really want to get it loose actually I'm going to safely sit that in there it's got a couple of clips on the ends of the front panel but I'm sure it'll have screws 
underneath it as well. Looks like we've got two or three, here are three of them. But just to get these rubber mounts to sit on their little pins, it's probably ideal to remove the front. A lot of CD players will allow you to get the deck in and out without taking the front off, but this one's just to get it, make it easy. I think it's best to take this off. Oops, I should have took the little level knob off the front here. Didn't even realise it really had that. So now I've got the power switch and stuff been in the way a bit, but I can lift that up and make sure I mount all these rubber bits on their pins. Just some little pins sitting up next to the screws, where the screws go. And then we can probably hopefully put that front back on, or is this going to be too... I you know, made this power wire a bit short. So it's yeah, a bit of a catch-22 with this one. You can't really get the mech in with the front panel on, but you can't get the front panel back. I might pull that plug. I've got another one there. I might be able to just remove those ones and get this enough. No, I don't, still don't. There's another. Oh, no, that's one I unplugged. No, this AC is a bit. I might just cut this. If I put it on there, they're probably a bit big, those ones. Get rid of that cable tie. I might be able to sneak it a little bit. Through that one, that's it. While I'm here, I'll just look. That little pot looks alright. Yeah, nice looking circuit board in this. Got a big Mitsubishi chip, Sony chip, Sony, got an RF servo, another Sony chip, and some sort of surface mount by the look of it, which is a Sony. So this is. Virtually a Sony, I reckon that Mitsubishi is probably just, oh there's another Sony hiding in there too. 8F236, A1082, yeah, they're all different chips. So this is largely a Sony and then like I said, the, the Mitsubishi I was about to say, looks like it probably, judging by the big connector there, runs the buttons and the, so that'll be the micro to run the buttons and the display. Whereas all the signal, digital signal processing looks to be Sony stuff. I'm not sure if that cable went there, I think it did. Just get those end bits to clear. Oh, I've got it on the wrong side, that doesn't help. That's better. I wonder why it wasn't clicking in. I'll just leave the screws out of that for now, I think. Plug that other one back in, so it looks like it's got signal, signal processing by Sony. Digital analog, it says something about two, what's it say on the front? Two digital analog converters or something, so. So we've got that chip probably processes some of the early laser signal stuff and maybe the servo. The servo being what controls the, the motors basically. So we've got power supply. What's this? Servo, RF servo. Which I assume is probably this. Well, this has got all our little trim pots. So it'll be, um, geez, I'm trying to remember what they're all called now. Something to do with tracking and something to do with focus. It's been a while since I've done a CD player, so really since the year 2000, there hasn't been much call for CD player repair like there used to be. It doesn't really say what that board does. So that's your digital to analog. That must be your A to D converter. It doesn't look like anything special. There's a little Sanyo chip and a couple other chips, some of which are probably just to boost the level a bit. Unless this is... what did that board say on it? RF servo. So that's more servo stuff. That's micro. That may be some sort of interface between the microprocessor and the servo. Not sure, but it has quite a few chips in it. Probably more than most CD players. Most of the later ones had very little in them. Often one or two big surface mount chips under the board and not much else. But we'll put the, I might put the screws back in the actual mech itself just to hold it in place. Oops, drop that in there. And we'll see if we can find a belt. 
Uh, that's the only hassle. I might need this mecha. I reckon that pin pulls out of that. I've just realised I can't get the belt on because I'd have to get it between those two gears. But I can't, so I'll have to take this black gear out to get the the belt in, which is annoying. Most CD players, you can just get to the top of the, to the pulley on the motor and the pulley on the other gear. No need to actually remove anything. It's just accessible at the top. Some of the older players are a bit more complicated, so I think I'd say that grey pin holds the the gears in place. I'm gonna have to I'm not sure if I have to align something there or not. It's probably could be get a little fiddly. If I'm kinda of get it out in a certain position it might so I'm just pushing on this because it's tending to want to wind back down so that helps stop any of that happening. So if I make a note, see those gears shouldn't matter too much, that's at the end of the tray. I probably should have left that out actually in hindsight. Should have done it with that out. So this, this basically just sits with the pin at the low end of the ramp up against this little piece. So that's like a, that's a two-way leaf switch under that. So that tells it when it's probably reached one end or the other. There's two other pins there that just sort of, they're not actually engaged. But the, the middle one's sort of pointing towards, is that a little mark there? Yeah, there are a couple of marks, but they're pointing towards the end of the tray. Now, I'm not sure if I can grab that with something or not. Maybe a pair of needle nose pliers. That might not be the best tool. I can get my fingernail under it. I mean, you could probably even use side cutters. It's starting to lift a bit, I think, but you've got to be super careful with these plastic parts that you don't break them. It doesn't really feel like it's wanting to come. It doesn't seem to be anything down the other end of it. Look, it's got a bit of play in it, but it may just be that you've got to pull a bit harder to clip it. I think in hindsight I probably should have left this thing oh, done that too early. Should have left this thing apart, I think. I forgot to actually look, I was gonna look on while I had it out. What was under there if anything? Probably nothing, but in case there's some obvious way of unclipping it. Now I've got to press those clips again. I'll take these connectors out. It's tempting to actually unscrew the power switch and get rid of that completely. Maybe I should just leave the front over there. Yeah, there's nothing obvious there at all. So it probably presses in from the top and you've just got to use a bit of force to pop it out. But obviously I don't want to break anything. Because I know some of these pins can be a little fiddly Yes, I don't really need to do the tray at all. Whoops, gone to, uh, I already stuffed it. <laughs> I don't think this is overly fussed about where you sit things. It probably doesn't need any special alignment. It's because this one moves independent of the other one. As long as you get this sort of tray. Oh no, I did it. I broke it. <laughs> Well, that didn't pull out. That's a real pain. I can probably just put something in there to... Oh, now this thing's going to be in the way, so I'm going to have to unclip this bit that does the switch as well. So I'm not sure how that bit's meant to come out. I'm going to have to take that gear off as well. And then there's a little plastic washer on that one. Yeah, it didn't take that, so I was afraid that would happen. Maybe you could actually push something up from underneath. Now yeah, that I think about it, I wonder if I could have done that. Ooh, possibly I could have. If I can find something small enough. Maybe I should have pushed something up that hole. No, it doesn't seem to do anything. Although that screw I was, oh, yeah, was probably hitting before it gets up there. What can I use? I found this thing actually just pushed down through the bottom and it's designed, it's got a little ridge on there with a little 
ramp up to it so it does push in and clip into something in there but usually just a little bit extra force on these on the top and it should just pop back out again and this one just broke quite easily so not a great design maybe just because the plastic's getting so old in this but yeah in theory it might, might act probably would be better to try and find something thin to push it from below at least then you're just pushing on the end of that little shaft and there's no risk of breaking the top off but I have had things like that before and you just yeah, you give them a little bit of a nudge with some side cutters or something just lift them up and they pop right out but it's also possible the side cutters sort of put all the force on one side so they're not the ideal they don't lift it evenly so it might have had something to do with it and it's just yeah, one of these little plastic clips that one ain't looking the best after I've taken it off I do have a set of those somewhere replacement ones I think it's got a little bit of grease on it yeah that's still nice and liquid so now we can finally see about finding a belt to see that just double check that's all clean I guess the other good thing is now I've got it off I can double check there is a little bit of belt material there I can see a little bit of black stuff on there it's more on the outside so it won't matter but and it normally earns a hair in there which can go yeah it's got some nice grease normally you'd, if these shafts look dry or anything but you can put your finger on there and see a little bit of glistening so that's got plenty of grease on it doesn't want a lot but you could lubricate these while you're in here if they were dry but they're not so shouldn't be too bad now I need to find these new belts I ordered that one's probably a bit big ah. oh yeah look at this beautiful all sorts of little belts these are proper ones from Wagner Electronics and these dodgy Chinese ones off eBay that would be damn close I reckon can't measure the put a bit of string or something around there if you don't I actually like to keep a set of belts in stock because it's much easier just to find one that suits and often you can you get used to what size is what that's a little bit too long just be careful you don't get grease on that but I mean certainly if you're gonna pull something like this apart you don't want to have to order a belt in each time but you can measure them with a bit of string or something that's around the next size down there handy I just ordered all these because I was out of all that's what I used them all on all the shorter belts so that's what a 30 by 1.4 actually got a 19 which is a very small one pretty rare to use them but this one's a 27 so what was the other one a 30 so 27 is going to be getting a bit closer but these small belts are very handy you seem to use them a lot not so much in cassette players but CD players, DVD players, they're all full of these little ones. Really doesn't want to go down there. Might have to lift the gear up to even get it on. Because even that post that the next gear's on is in the way. That's still probably a tad big. See how that's hanging out. Question is, did I get all the sizes in between? I hope I did. Yeah, a little bit of this one, I think. We've got a 25 and then a 22 so 25 why don't we've got some other ones here too 22 25 I just ordered a lot of the ones I didn't have I actually think one of these 1.2 belts is probably better if I've got a 22 that's still a 1.4 I've got the wrong one anyway either a 1.4 or 1.2 square belt is what we need that one feels like it's going to do the job look at that so that's tight but not too tight it's got a few twists in it we'll just run it around a few times we'll get rid of that maybe not oh yeah there are we there doesn't have to take the twist out of them yeah that's got it Is that a bit of possibly got a bit of grease on that? Usually best to clean them anyway, just if you've had your hands on them and stuff. Just for the 
longevity of the belt and to make sure there's nothing going to slip on the pulleys just give it a clean and if you can get into the pulleys a bit just give them a clean just to make sure there isn't grease on there so that was a 22 by 1.4 I put in there 22 by 1.2 would probably do where's the old belt? the old belt is a 1.4 I think it looks quite large get it without getting goop all over me yeah it's a 1.4 belt in it so the old one definitely 1.4 so now I need to put that little gear in and that little clip in here you can just push the clips back on just make sure they've closed up because that's a sign that they've got in the slot you can always pull back up on it it's not coming out so that's a good sign It's got a little bit of grease on it, so that these probably wanted a little bit on them. And then, did I have to put them back on together? I've got that in the wrong place. Doesn't really matter at this stage. Uh, let's see, I probably should wind that tray back to the out position because I fiddled with it while I was messing with the belt. If I at least put everything back the way it was. As far as alignment goes, actually I think that, that was there, I think. I should be pressing on the switch. Now just be careful, the switch goes up into a little slot in this thing, so make sure you get the little plastic bit on the switch in there. And there's just a little clip, so once I've got that in place, I'll just push down, because if you push down the wrong place, you may bend the switch. So I think that's... Oh, actually, we've got that engage which we shouldn't until yeah until that little pointy bit out of there comes in and now we're in business as far as I don't want to touch the belt now because I might have greasy fingers yeah and that's at the end that switch is engaged by then anyway by the look of it so as we come to this little raised bit here you can see the switch turn around so that's that tells the micro to turn off the the load motor so we should be able to set this mech back in place. Put the front back on and this should be a working CD player now. How well it works is a completely different thing. Because what they play like is a whole other thing, but hopefully that being a Sansui, it's it doesn't look like it's had an awful lot of use this one. But it's always hard to tell with a CD player. But usually the well used ones have a lot more dust and stuff in them. It's just, you know, often they're a bit dirtier and stuff, but you still don't know for sure if it's a really clean home. But just the act of getting discs in and out all the time is enough to get a bit of dust and stuff in them. And I guess probably with them spinning and the heat and stuff might even attract a bit. And that was probably the laser going into position. Well, that's one thing I can't show is... Yeah, that's the sled. Sled does go out. Can't really show it with this in place. And the laser's going up and down. That means it's looking for a disc. Oop, something's not quite right. It's not quite making it to the end. So because this thing, the way it's designed, it obviously times the tray. And if the tray doesn't get out, Wrong way in a certain time and hit the end stop. Oh, which switch? That's the end stop. So, this is so that's already. St oh, wait, what have we done? So, the end switch for the tray itself looks to be a little switch down in there. Now, part of this could be if I'm not fully, if I've got the front panel fully lined up or something, but it seems to be alright. I'm not sure what's making that noise, that doesn't sound good. Are we, oh, are we catching on this? Yeah, I think it's grating against that gear, so maybe I haven't got this fully aligned right. Oh, that should be right, because that comes along and goes into that slot. 
Uh, so this is just, I think, this gear because it just does the clamp. Oh yeah, I've gone past the end position, which is not good. Because that shit's such, because I can wind it further than it should go. So that's just telling the machine that the clamp's up or down, I think. That's, I think that's grating against that a little bit. Yes, that's gone down too early, so that shouldn't be happening. Oops. So that should reach the end. Pretty sure that shouldn't be making that noise. Because that hasn't... Yeah, what's going on? I've got that gear a bit out of alignment now. So we've hit the end there. Clamps down. The motor should stop. And when we come up, we lift the clamp up. That's now, oh, it hasn't actually hit the, okay, that's our problem, it's not hitting the switch. So that is definitely out of whack somewhere. The switch is there, why does that disengage? It hit, starts moving it. But that hasn't, yeah, that should go around to there. So I reckon that's because that switch isn't getting engaged, that's what the microprocessor's noticing. So what finish is that turning? There must be a bit more to this than meets the eye. Or is it because I haven't put that pin back in? I don't think so. So that's engaged, this re-engages when the tray comes in, the tray actually presses against it, that goes to the end position. Something must. That should go around that ever so a bit further. That's still grating against it if that's what is actually making that noise. Okay, let's remove that completely. Oh, wait up, have we got something? There's something sticking up there. It is, but I'm not sure it's meant to stick up there. So these gears seem to move completely independently. Ooh, actually there's something I'll just, just realise. There should be something in there, surely. Dropped a little washer, that doesn't help. Make some what escapes. Yeah, and there's no... That just aligns with the tray itself. I reckon that was in there, must have been. So let's see if that goes... Yeah, there's no sign of that sound. So eventually that tray runs out of out of teeth to engage with that gear. So how does that re-engage? So I may have something in the wrong position here. And that's the big hassle is uh, oh, where are, does that, when that turns, does that give that the, that hasn't flicked the tray enough to, oh, where are, that must turn on, because that has to turn independently, so the tray should be in the down position, so that would explain, yeah, uh, that's not in the down position, yeah, that can turn independent. So the idea is the tray the, it runs out of teeth, so that disengages from the black gear, which means just this white gear can turn 
to lift the the clamp up and down. So so the black gear is turning with the white gear, but it's not hasn't got any teeth to work on. So so it's actually this little bit sticking out on this white gear has to push the tray forward for it to engage. So now this is pushing the tray forward and at some point it's far enough forward that the black gear meets the teeth on the on the actual edge of the tray again and the tray runs. So it might have been just that washer because it's not making that grating I reckon that was just sitting down too low because I left that washer out. Now that's not grating so that's probably all that was. Uh, now this should be in but whether that caused it not to flick the switch is a whole other part of the story. So if I get that switch in the right place. Switch still isn't pressed at this point, which worries me a bit. Because I'm pretty sure it should be. Okay, switches. Whoops, I've gone too far because it actually hits the end there. White gear only turn or engaging that, then engages that. But it hasn't actually hit the switch, or whether it should. Oh, maybe. Is there anything to hit on the end? When do that switch hits? Okay. Well, turn it on and see what happens. Well, it works fine now. So it's just that washer, but that doesn't... I would have expected that to have to hit that switch, unless it momentarily does. So when we're in the down position, the switch is pushed that way. No, it doesn't. Very odd. But it's quite happy to work now. Maybe it was just slowed down a bit by that other gear scraping, I don't know. Now I've lost that CD. What did I do with that? It's fallen on the floor. So that was just a silly little thing I missed, is that little washer. That might be all it needed. So we've got our... That's what it should read, your table of contents. Oh, it's just disappeared off the screen. That'll be right. So when it comes in, loads down, lays it in, and that should read up the full contents of the disc. Now it's going to make it lower on me again, and that's just really slow. So 89 minutes, etc. Number of tracks. It seems to read the disc, the tracks nice and quickly. A lot of these better quality players didn't like going past the Red Book standards, which are the standards for CD players originally set out, which I think was 64 minutes or something around that on the was the maximum to be found on a CD. So some of these you had to kind of detune them a bit, or they wouldn't play the sort of discs that were getting out more into the 70 something minutes towards 80 minutes. I think the maximum you can fit on a CD ROM. But some discs started having finer, the tracks are closer together to fit them on there. And like the cheapest Samsung or whatever you could buy would play them perfect. But you have a nice hi fi sort of component CD player, and often they'd have trouble reading them because they were so well tweaked to the Red Book standard. But they didn't like those sort of discs, and this one's got. How many? Did that actually say beyond 80 minutes? I was I imagining that? I don't think, I didn't think they could go past 80. Was that the number? Oh, 49 minutes. That must. Be, oh, is that the number of tracks? I was going to say 89. I thought it was that. That must be the yeah track one. So that's the time there. So I read that wrong. It's got 89 tracks. This disc. That's an odd one. What was it? Piano lessons or something? Yep, we're well into the 30s. God, that's got to be a record for. Have we got a way of seeing time? Uh, it doesn't give me the time left on the track. But yeah, we're on track 51, which is pretty crazy. So it's got a little light to say the, the disc is in there, I guess. 
which is good because if you turn the thing off and forget whether you've got a disc in there or not, that's actually not a bad feature because most of them you wouldn't know. So it's, I guess, something a higher quality unit includes. I'll also put that knob back on and st I'll screw the panel back on. So the last test is to actually hook it to an amp. Piano Adventures. Background accompaniments. Or however you say it. Now what I'm going to do is... Get my amp, the speakers, oh, back to the amp, and oh, I need an input there. Where's my RCA lead gone? Better get rid of all these belts and stuff. I can go back off to put them in with the other ones. See how you know, you just hooked into that signal generator, that'll do. I've never seen to have leads organised. Where are you? I'm going to have to look at it, aren't I? Uh, get rid of that adapter. Auxiliary. Is that? That's a piano. Sounds like a test CD or something. Tap on the CD player gives an idea how good its tracking is. If it's really bad, it'll skip on just about anything. Now, I had some old discs here somewhere. Always pays to have like a pretty beaten up CD that you know what tracks will play and what won't. These are just some burnt discs that didn't work out too well. Yeah, not real happy with that. When you start hearing these funny noises and that clicking noise. That's the perfect, that little sort of clicking noise there coming out of the speakers is a good sign it's having trouble reading. This one's probably a bit too bad, but... And that's another sign when it's repeating parts. So a click, 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 repeating the same part of the track. You could actually buy a proper test disc that had like little dots and stuff stuck on them to test them. But I often found if you if you knew a disc, had a disc that was a bit rough and knew the problems with it, that was as good a test disc as any. And it probably had music that was less annoying than the actual test disc. Again, go to the later tracks on the disc, and if it plays them, it should play pretty well. So it's a little bit piggy there. If it goes sort of fairly quickly back to where it was, it's not doing too bad. This one's pretty good. It's, it's even when I give it a good thump. If you bang on the actual mechanism part, which is on the other side of the 
and they've just got the end of the disc other side of the rubber mounts and if it gives up completely and goes back to the beginning of the disc it's probably not playing real well but this one seems to be playing fairly good but you can actually align these different trim pots in them to actually get them to play a bit better I'm trying to remember what they were actually they should have some abbreviations on them I'll have to see if I can find the manual for this I think two are tracking and two are focus I think was it focus bias and tracking bias or something and offset or something god it's been so long since I've done one that's actually labelled but chances are with a, a more quality unit like this it's, if it's working reasonably well it will will be fine that's a very scummy looking disc I think that one was lying on the floor for a while and got pretty knocked around reads the table of contents did I turn that right down? I probably did yeah, you can hear that clicking sort of sound oops, where's the track skip I mean, if they take a while to change tracks you can hear that thing sort of hunting a bit that sort of noise it makes, often they'll make a little bit of that, but if they take a while, another sign they're not working too well. That's not working too bad. I'll get copyright strike on that thing. Definitely a bit of DA here. Yeah, it's having trouble getting to the end and it's found it, but it's not too good. Skipping through the track too can give you an idea if it if you're skipping across the track often it, if it's not running well it'll lose its place completely and often stop playing the disc give up and go back to the start or basically just stop and you'll hear the laser run back to the center but yeah those discs are in terrible condition there's actually a hole through the top layer and that one I think it's normally damage on the top side of the disc is the worst but I do need to sort out some discs again that I know are marginal. I used to have a few that I I used all the time. That's all you need them when these are quite scratched. And yeah, you don't want holes through the top. That'll really cause them trouble if you put them up to the light and you can see through them. That's a very bad disc. I think this is pretty good, this machine. Should play most things pretty well So that's been new belt, lubricated and cleaned as needed. Uh, clean the laser. Like I say, if this was having tracking problems, you can actually adjust these trim pots. 
it's always nice to know which one's which but you can sort of just get in and do the sort of tap test or play it on bad tracks I found that like you could in the manuals they tell you all this stuff about reading the RF waveform coming off the laser here somewhere there should be a what was it the I waveform or something there's a little grounded RF on this little test point here so you can hook your oscilloscope up to that and then you tweak all these things according to the manual which was only really the factory setup and basically it was pretty useless for most CD players once they'd been out in the world a bit and were having trouble uh, so what you'd have to do is basically just give them a bit of a tweak there let's say sometimes you had to detune ones to play the longer discs other ones you'd have a few skipping problems and you'd give it the normal clean and service and then you'd just go through and adjust these things so it would play certain bad discs well and wouldn't you know crash when you hit it when you give it a tap it wouldn't just crash go back to the stop or whatever so you could often just tweak these pots like I say two of them should be for tracking and two for focus if I remember rightly and yeah I found generally using the the eye pattern on the on the RF coming off the disc was pretty much useless I went through and learned all the stuff about CD players that came out and even did a course on it I think and all of it was pretty useless in the end you just find you just sort of got to work it out yourself and just your bad discs are the best ones to test them on the sort of tap test and um, a lot of these um, later ones you get the especially the Sony ones with the long shafted motors in them for the the disc platter they would just skip and carry on because the motor was faulty so I used to replace a lot of those I think 43 millimeter with a RF210 or something something 210 motors I think they were um, they were very common for failing a lot of them just got so bad the actual lasers would fail in them You'd, and the Sony ones at least were really cheap you could replace them at a decent price with a customer but a lot of these sort of more oddball lasers that were used by some of the more the more fancy CD players and that could you know cost you well over a hundred dollars some up to two hundred odd dollars and um, yeah, a lot of people didn't want to spend the money on them um, so you do a few laser swaps um, a lot of those motors I had to change in the Sony's and even some of the sharps and stuff I think used a similar motor they might have been a bit different or two sort of different types of motors I think different makers and so they were a common thing yeah belts loading belts and stuff very common to go on CDs and some of the cheaper ones here yeah, you just try and tweak them up get them going for the customer as best you could a lot of them yeah they didn't they didn't come back again so I assume they kept going for a while once you gave them a bit of an alignment but it was more or less a sort of hit and miss thing I so said when, when I knew what the the pots were labelled in a lot of them and you sort of knew which ones to tweak and on which discs so you sort of got a, a knack of doing that and that just seemed to be the best way to fix the things um, I do have to fix this little pin thing that I broke oops I dropped it in there now so I might just get a very small screw and washer just so this can't pop off I guess when the clamps up is the only time that can come that actually can't move much because of this switch lever so it's almost unnecessary to have that in there but um, I'll just get that little bit out so I could all I reckon if I left this as it is it would probably be fine oops dropped it again slippery little thing oh I didn't put the door back on so I better do that too usually these a lot of these are a pain because you, if the mechanism is jammed you can't get it out because the door parts holding it in place so these just slide back in there you just get these two little edge bits to line up with the slot push it down it'll bulge out a bit in the middle where those little clips are and I should just click home and you'll see it go back in then when you press on it, it won't go back up again oh and the other thing I've got to do oh, I've got to put a clip lead back on on that cable probably be all right without one it's just more for a factory thing so it doesn't can't move around and catch on anything and I'll have to put a new power cord on it and then I can just put that clamp grommet back in there and I'd say this one's actually fixed it could do with a bit of a clean I don't think there's any muck on the inside of that shame it didn't have the remote with this but but this is actually quite a nice CD player so I might see if I can find a little screw and washer for that so if you ever pull old electronic stuff apart it pays to keep all the screws out of it and like you know that's the sort of washer collection I've gathered over the years just out of old equipment so millions of shake proof as well as just the normal washers they're getting a bit mixed up in there now they've probably escaped under these dividers 
but there's every size and shape imaginable there. Well, I guess they're all round technically, but well, that's exactly the sort of washer I want. And if I just put a screw in there just to hold it down without actually tightening it right up, unfortunately, most of the ones I kept seem to be the, the metal threads. Another source of good screws is actually from cars. They have larger sizes and you'll normally find sort of standard whatever they are Japanese type ones. This is actually a slightly bigger one. I think they came out of an Akai TV set or something. But they only go up to a certain size whereas cars have, have plastic screws and stuff that go up even bigger. Now is that a thinner thread? Maybe not. And then you get some extra small screws as well out of certain electronic stuff. No, I don't think that's as thin as I wanted. Eh, see if I put a screw in there that's too big, it'll actually well, risk splitting the plastic, but also spread it out and make mean that gear doesn't turn as well. I know I had some very fine screws somewhere. But I can't remember where. Looks like one of them. But is that anything? It is a little bit fine. Oh yeah, that is probably the one I'm looking for. Yeah, I think that is the type of thread. Unfortunately, they're probably a little bit long. Yeah, that's the one I want, but is that going to leave it loose? I think that is it. That's a slightly thinner thread. Yeah, that's still loose as. I'll just get it close to pushing the washer down hard. If I get it to where the washer's flat and then just back off a bit. And that should be it. Beautiful. So that's a simple repair for that little little pin that broke but yeah in hindsight I probably should have tried to push it up from below usually or maybe use something that levered it up from both sides a bit more evenly but again it could have just been the age but anyway I can screw this all back together and I'll actually hook it up and put a new power cord on it I might give this a bit of a proper test run the best test run is actually to put it some discs in it and give it a good play like I say especially if you've got some some more scratch sort of discs that could be a little bit iffy in all this place, let them warm up to full temperature, play them for a disc or two. And if it plays some pretty bad discs without skipping and carrying on, you can be pretty sure she's alright. This one doesn't look like it actually needs uh, any further tweaking. I do have another old one around here somewhere that's bound to be a bit iffy, so I might dig that out. I think it's a TAC or something, one of their old, or a CDC, one of those old, when did they come out? Must have been early 90s, late 80s, somewhere around there. So I might have a look at that, that's bound to need a bit of a tweak because they were never really all that good in the first place. I think they were actually Japanese made but they were very low end. They were about the cheapest CD player you could buy at the time, back when CD players were still pretty expensive. So I might have a play with that one. And you'll see that might actually have a bit more needs doing to it other than just a belt. So I'll catch on that one.